Here's a list of all the cognitive phenomena we're going to look at in the class. Not all of it, but a sample of the cognitive phenomena we're going to look at in the class. Uh, we have a network that looks at uh, visual scenes. It looks at pictures from my our trip to New Zealand, <laughs> and um, it actually extracts the statistics of those pictures and efficiently encodes the information present in that visual uh, in those visual scenes. And um, that's an interaction between these learning principles and the sensory information that's coming in that is very well understood. And we know how the neurons in the early levels of the visual system are organized. And this model really pulls that all together and shows how these patterns of neural connectivity emerge directly from seeing natural visual images like you see every day. So it's really putting that whole loop together, showing how something that we really know does it does exist in the brain can be understood in a very clear way, in a very principled way, using these, these principles that we've developed in the first half of the test. Uh, next, we'll look at uh, spatial attention, which is uh, capturing these bi-directional connections among neurons and showing how higher levels of the brain, lower levels of the brain, different pathways in the brain can all work together to focus our attention in one part of the visual field or another and coordinate neural processing on different aspects of the overall scene or world that we might be looking at. And we also are able to capture the effects of brain damage in these networks. Uh, so it turns out that there's a fairly common pattern of brain damage occurring through strokes in a particular part of what we call the parietal lobe. And this produces a phenomenon called hemispatial neglect. And it's unfortunate, but it's also quite remarkable uh, that this occurs in many individuals. They just cannot process an entire half of visual space. And it's really striking how that works, yet we can understand how that works in terms of these networks of interacting neurons. And because our, our models are based on the biology of the brain, it gives us that ability to understand how individual neurons working together in the brain actually produce these different effects. And so we can understand effects of brain damage, we can effects, understand effects of drugs. Um, it really gives us an extra dimension that we can use to apply what we've learned about these models to understand things that are happening to real people in the world. We'll also look at episodic memory, the uh, very small uh, kind of remarkable area of your brain right there in the temporal lobe, in the medial or mi middle part of your temporal lobe is called the hippocampus. You've probably heard of it. There's a famous patient named Henry Meliasson um, who recently passed away, but he was one of the first people who was extensively studied who was missing this hippocampal region and through uh, surgery performed to relieve his epilepsy. And it's just striking. I mean, he was unable to form new memories of his daily experiences. And from that, we learned that this little tiny part of the brain, which of course they had no idea was going to produce this massive effect, um, we now know is, is really playing a huge outsized role in, in storing and encoding these memories. Why? Why this little tiny part of the brain? Why is that so important? Um, actually, our computational models help us understand this. So we can understand why this part of the brain has different parameters. So we talked about there's these general principles that apply across the brain. And then each little area has its own specific set of parameters. And it turns out the hippocampus has a specific set of parameters that help it learn very quickly and very efficiently these kind of snapshots of daily experience. And so it essentially over evolution has become specialized to have those set of parameters that enable it to learn quickly without suffering from a lot of interference that would otherwise occur. Um, so we have a very complete and very well-tested understanding of the role of the hippocampus in episodic memory. And we have a nice computer model that you can use to explore and again, damage and simulate somebody like HM or somebody like perhaps, you know, your friends if they drink too much and you can see how alcohol or benzodiazepines or other kinds of substances impair the function of this memory system. Um, so there's lots of applications of these models. Um, 
We will also look at working memory, which is another kind of memory supported by the active firing of neurons, more concentrated in the prefrontal cortex, and there are special properties of those networks in the prefrontal cortex that allow those neurons in those areas to maintain neural firing and maintain a focus on a particular set of information that you're trying to process. For example, I'm right now trying to focus on what I'm trying to say for this lecture. Uh, you may be focused on what I'm saying or something else, but you're perhaps be not trying to be distracted by other things going on around you, especially in these times. And uh, that ability to focus and concentrate really comes from this working memory, this ability to have neurons that kind of latch on to information and maintain it in this active firing state in prefrontal cortex. So that's another specialization for a different part of the brain. Um, we'll look at language, two different phenomena in language, for example. One about how uh, we learn to pronounce English words. Um, many of you may be non-native English speakers and have wrestled with this beast of, of English, like why are everything, why is everything pronounced so differently? And why aren't there any rules? And that has given a lot of uh, interesting evidence and, and behavioral data that helps us understand how these networks that do enable us to pronounce words, how those are shaped through experience, and how our brain is able to balance between weird exceptions that we have, like the word yacht, which my dad insists on pronouncing as yachet um, still, uh, versus uh, very regular words like can or something like that, that everybody pronounces the same way. So there's a lot of rich, interesting data that, from, that comes from language that we can use to understand how networks of the brain work together. Another fundamental mystery, again, in the line of emergent phenomenon, is where does knowledge come from? How do we ever learn something new? And here we can really understand this core idea about that, you know, knowledge is not kind of some little specific location in your brain where some little box with a label on it that says, oh, here's where the meaning of this word is stored. In fact, knowledge emerges out of networks of interconnected neurons. And we have uh, ways of understanding exactly how that works using the computer models. And uh, that gives us a, a very much richer and, and fuller understanding of where knowledge comes from. It comes, it emerges out of the neurons. And again, this sounds somewhat mystical, but it really is something that we can understand in a very detailed way through the computational models. Finally, we'll look at, uh, again, how these working memory representation, uh, working memory abilities in frontal cortex can support executive function and uh, the ability to uh, plan, reason, and do higher levels of cog cognition that require this kind of high level of con cognitive control, uh, staying focused and, and staying on task. Okay, so that's the whole range of phenomena we'll be looking at. Looking forward to uh, following up in the next lecture with more information about the individual neurons.